Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Tuesday Night Edition. We have a great uh, opportunity here, Dr. Cecilia Kenning, talking about glaucoma, optic nerve, masqueraders. She practices the University of Colorado School of Medicine in Colorado. Her primary focus is anterior segment ocular surface disease, neuro-ophthalmic disease, and perioperative care. Dr. Kenny is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry, an active member of the AOA, and has served as both local and state officers in AOA. She was named Young Optometrist of the Year in 2019 by the state of Virginia. She lectures nationally, locally, internationally at conferences, has written numerous publications. We've had her on a number of events, and we keep inviting her back because she's really a treat to listen to and a foremost educator to learn from. So with that, Cecilia, please take it away. Perfect. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome, and it's always good to be back um, with OEC. Great staff, great people putting this together, but also a really great audience. So tonight, we are going to be talking about, as um, Joe mentioned, glaucoma, neuro, kind of the intersection of the two. And, you know, what are we looking at when we see these patients and what do we do for them when it is somebody who has a secondary glaucoma that is caused by um, a neurological condition, whether it be an active or, a, you know, kind of post issue. So just to make sure these are my disclosures, they have been mitigated. And with glaucoma, this is something that is that we are all very familiar with, right? And the disease burden of glaucoma itself, approximately 76 million people will suffer from all types of glaucoma. Um, and it's estimated to reach 111 million by 2040. At least half of those are unaware that they're affected. And that's not a surprise to us, right? We know that it is kind of that, that silent vision stealer. Um, most people are actually coming to us asymptomatic. Even if it's that six-year-old patient who's got 0.9 cups and has definitely had glaucoma for some time, they may not be aware that their vision has been affected because it typically is something that's so slow, chronic, progressive, and it starts in our vision in the periphery and then moves in. And when we talk about different types of glaucoma, you know, we know that it's going to continue to increase because as we get older, as our generations get older and there's more of us in each generation, more people are going to unfortunately become glaucoma, our glaucoma patients. And when we talk about secondary glaucoma, secondary glaucoma is not obviously primary, right? It's not the cause primarily, and it's also not the number one in the, uh, the percentages of our total volume of glaucoma. It's estimated that about 19.7% or about 20% of our glaucoma patients are actually secondary glaucoma. And when is it secondary glaucoma? So when do we really truly call it that? And, and then what do we do for those patients? And how do we figure this out? And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about, uh, especially at this first part of the lecture, is how do we make that decision if this patient has glaucoma and is it secondary? And we really need to kind of take in the whole picture. We have to look at the optic nerve cupping. We need to look at the medical history. We need to look at visual field analysis, our angles, any other clues that can tell us that what we're seeing is truly from primary glaucoma versus something that maybe isn't even glaucoma in itself, right? So let's first talk, start by talking about optic nerve head cupping. And the optic nerve head cupping, when we look at our primary glaucoma versus secondary glaucoma, actually look a little bit different. In the pathophysiology of cupping with our true glaucomatous patients, this typically tends to be a more deep cupping. And we get more atrophy versus true pallor. Um, they, they look a little bit different. And the cupping is believed to occur because, and the reason we get this deep cupping is it's because it's becoming from the damage to the laminar deformation. So if we think about it, we've got pressure inside the eye and that pressure inside the eye is pushing on the nerve itself from there and it's causing laminar insult. And so the damage here is more primarily IOP related. We can talk about our episcleral venous 
uh, pressure and there's some thoughts on there with our normal tension glaucoma. And so there is probably actually some prelaminar insult as well, but majority when we see a deep cup, we're probably looking at more glaucomatous damage versus the pathophysiology of a non-glaucomatous um, damage to the optic nerve. We're looking at a very shallow nerve. And this is because the damage is more occurring pre-laminar tissue versus uh, laminar, okay? And if we think about it, most of our optic neuropathy or damage to the nerve um, posterior is related to microvascular changes. And so it's actually coming from the back end and that's why it tends to be a more shallow nerve here. Other things that we should be looking at when we're talking about this is everything else, right? Uh, we need to look at the whole picture. So if this patient is coming in and saying, hey, I've had loss of vision and it's more central versus I feel like maybe it's encroaching from the periphery. This happened within the last month versus uh, I haven't really noticed it. You're actually the first person to be pointing this out to me. Those are going to be the things that make us think, hey, something quick, something central, or even peripheral and central or peripheral and quick, that's not likely glaucoma because glaucoma is typically, especially our primary open angle glaucoma, it is a slow progressive issue. Um, other things to think about is that, is the patient having dimming in their vision? Are they noticing that like just less light and, you know, we can talk about cataracts, but think about multiple things together at the same time, right? Decrease blurred vision, poor visual acuity, looking at the nerve itself. Are we looking at one nerve that is pale and 0.9 shallow and the other is 0.3 pretty pink and doing fine? That asymmetry, that's not normal with glaucoma either, right? Especially primary open angle. Uh, if we also think about pain, now with non-glaucomatous, especially if it's acute, they might have some pain if it's chronic or if it's been uh, an, an issue that's already occurred, probably not going to have pain. Um, and then color vision reduction. APD, when we talk about APD, it's not common in our glaucomatous patients unless they're severe or very progressed glaucoma. And then yes, you are probably going to have an APD, um, but you're also going to have a patient who has hand motion or counting fingers and or light perception, right? That's when we're going to have that with our glaucoma patient. Now we are, uh, we have a patient who has 20, 40 vision, some peripheral defect or central defect, but they also have an APD. That's not glaucoma. That's something else. Past that, we have to look at the patient as a whole. What other concomitant issues are going on? Are they hypertensive? Are they diabetic? Are they not controlled on either one of them? When we talk about neurological problems, when we talk about cranial nerve palsies, when we talk about ischemic optic neuropathy, whether it be non-arteritic or arteritic, um, these are things that tend to deal more with chronic microvascular problems. And so we wanna know What's their control? Trauma can be a part of this. We need to know their history there. Um, what other drugs have they been on? Uh, have they had any kind of surgeries, whether it be ocular or just in general surgeries around the time of loss of vision? And we'll talk about why as we go through some patients um, and other medications that they might be taking that are not related to the eye. And these are questions we ask anyway, but it's a good reminder as to why do we ask these questions? It's because surgeries, medications, all of these things can start to have an effect on our patients that um, are ocular related. With visual field defects, when we look at those, think about what is more of a classical glaucomatous defect versus what is considered more of a neurological defect. So are we seeing an early nasal step? Are we seeing an arcuate defect? or some paracentral, secocentral defects? Or are we seeing a bitemporal homonymous hemianopsia? Are we seeing something that is a dense constriction 360 with a nerve that doesn't look like it should have that? And that's where we kind of, kind of start to learn to turn our gears and go, okay, this isn't adding up. I don't think that's what this is. I don't think this is primary glaucoma. 
So we're going to start by going through a bunch of cases because that's how we learn best is kind of let's talk through and what's the thought process on this. In some of the questions that we're going to have, your polling questions are going to be around what do you think is going on? And of course, I'm never going to give you the whole story because what's the fun in that? I didn't get the full story when I started seeing the patient. So no, we're going to keep this. We're going to keep you guys on your toes. So patient number one, we have a 42-year-old male. In the right eye, we've got some inferior arcuate defect here and a large blind spot. If we looked at the indices and the gaze tracker, it's a, it is actually a reliable field, okay? In the left eye, we've got an arcuate defect, a little bit more dense maybe over here, extending into nasal. Maybe we've got a little early nasal step and an early uh, arcuate on the superior temporal uh, as well as in a large blind spot. Okay, so let's start. Just looking at visual field, does this fit pattern of a possible glaucomatous patient? It's not too far from, right? But we have a 42-year-old patient. Okay, so with only this information, of course, I'm going to give you more later. Let's go with the first polling question. Does this patient have glaucoma? Yes, for sure. Maybe, not for sure, or we don't have enough information. We'll give you guys just a second. I launched the uh, handout for you, Cecilia. It's in the chat box for those who want to download it. It was in the email, uh, the one right before the started about 15 to 20 minutes, and it'll be tonight also. Thank you. So here we go. I'm going to share the results. Okay. Yes, for sure. Maybe no, for sure. We don't have enough information and you can go any direction with this, right? Uh, to be honest, because we don't have enough information, you could say yes, they probably have some kind of glaucoma, right? Because of that, um, until proven otherwise, because of the visual field. Um, but let's see what was going on. Let's give you a little bit more information. This is, is it the fair to say that they would have a uh, an optic neuropathy. Maybe they could. Right? Okay. Well, Except I mean, glaucoma is an optic neuropathy, right? It is, in essence. Yep. It is. You got it. Okay. So it would be fair to say that in the in the true definition of an optic neuropathy. Absolutely. But it could, also be retina. At, it could also be retina. But guess what? This is his optic nerve. So we've got optic nerve bruising. So for this patient, that visual field loss is actually because of his optic nerve had drusen. So with optic nerve head drusen, this falls under the category of pseudoedema. There's other things that kind of fall into this, and we'll talk a little bit about that with uh, PHOMS. But with optic nerve head buried drusen, remember that these are acellular deposits of a buildup of calcium, amino acids, nucleic acids, and mucopolysaccharides that are forming because of impaired axonal metabolism in patients who are already genetically predisposed. And over time, they continue to enlarge because they're getting more buildup of calcium on the outside. And that's also partially how they're a little bit easier to identify with hyperreflectivity on um, B scan as well as on a CT. Uh, so with these, they're located within the optic nerve head in front of the lamina cribosa. So we're getting two issues there. We're getting the pushing on the lamina cribosa and uh, some blood vessels that are coming through there, but we're also getting pushing on to the above, which is the retinal nerve fiber layer. And as they continue to grow over time in the RNFL thins, that's when we're able to really start to see them is when we start getting thinning and enlarging of them. And that's why technically people, we say that they're born with them, right? But they get bigger as they get older. Um, we really don't know whether or not people are truly born with them just because of testing and things like that in, in newborns. Um, but because we understand that it's in theory from axonal metabolism, they may not be born, but they may start forming it very shortly thereafter, not 100%. Um, now, what we do know, though, is that the older people get, the more we're able to identify it. 
somebody who is in their, you know, young teens and or a child may just look like they have a slightly uh, uh, more disc at risk or a crowded disc. Um, they may not look like that at all, but because as they get larger, by the time they're usually around 18 or so, would I'd say that's the earliest I've really had patients being referred in to me for an opinion of, is this papilledema, do we have swelling, or is this optic nerve head drusen? Um, and people who see peds, now I don't see peds, so let's be honest there, you may actually be noticing some changes in these patients earlier than that, but... Um, 18 is about the time when I start to see them and having them sent to me for those opinions. Now that those patients, as they continue to get older, because that thinning, um, of the RNFL, the large, the enlargement of those deposits, we actually start to be able to really see them very well defined as we'll see in some of the photos. Now this only occurs in approximately 0.3 to 2% of the population. And as that RNFL thins and we, start to get more compression, that's when we actually start to have the accompanied visual field defects in up to 87% of these patients. So with, um, with the better understanding of optic nerve head dystrusion, there's a consortium that was, it's actually a whole bunch of really smart uh, Neuro-ophthalmologist, I actually am really lucky I get to work with one of them who's part of putting this consortium together. So we're getting better data about this and having a better idea of what risk are these patients at. Um, and what they found, this consortium was put out in 2022, was that the, their, the thought of the painless vision loss or the slow vision loss, or even in some of these patients, a sudden vision loss is maybe a right through 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 other... Uh, mechanisms. So not just the compression of the RNFL and damage to the RNFL, but also going back to what else is going through that lamina carbosa and right in that same area is a bunch of blood vessels, right? And so getting a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy or um, an actual um, ischemic optic NAION. So Greg, as you were mentioning and um, thinking about that as, a, as an issue here, for, especially for our patient, they can get a central retinary artery occlusion, central retinal vein occlusion, and then subsequent neovascularization from this. And a study that actually looked at retrospective studies of those who were age 50 or less who had had an NAION, which is still pretty young to have it, although we know that the age for that is between about 40 to 60 is, is the most prevalent um, time to see that. Those who were 50 or less who had, ex who had experienced an NAION, they actually found that 51 to 53% of NAIONs actually had optic dystrusion in that subset. So that's kind of interesting. Now, our previous diagnostic standards for optic dystrusion was a B scan or a CT imaging. And with CTs, we know less costly than an MRI. However, uh, obviously we're sending patients out. This is still one of those things up until more recently, and we'll talk about uh, using our OCTs and things like that in just a moment. But up until more recently, especially if I had an 18 year old or someone who is younger coming in, because I, yes, I still have a B scan that shows it, but anytime we have pediatrics, we tend to be a little bit more cautious and order a little extra testing just to be sure, because we don't want to miss something. Um, and so the limitation with these is that it does require adequate calcification to be able to be seen. Um, with fluorescein angiography and fundus autofluorescence, which is another option to use, the um, these are a little bit more insensitive to deeper lying optic distrusion. And so again, both of these with our, our younger patients still aren't necessarily the best way to do it because it's not as sensitive to those that aren't uh, as calcified or those that are deeper lying, which means they've got more overlying RNFL. Uh, which in typical, our younger patients are going to have that just because of the nature of how this works. Um, nice thing though, is guess what? Many of us are starting to realize we have with our non midriatic camera is we do have FAF and we're also starting to become a little bit more comfortable using it, especially with having to be more on with looking at our GA. Now, when is a CT helpful? Just because I think it's, it's important as we're talking through neuro to talk not just about using it, obviously, for this case, but let's talk a little bit about CT. 
We don't use CT very much when it comes to neuro-ophthalmology or neuro-optometry. Reason being is because it does not show as much with soft tissue. It does not really tell me if I'm concerned for tumors, mass, lesion, um, aneurysm, things like that. I'm not really getting as much information from it. Um, however, if I am concerned that there's a bony abnormality, a calcification, that there may be a fresh blood involvement um, or any bony involvement from soft tissue mass, or if I think that they've had a penetrating globe with some kind of metallic foreign body, I'm going to go ahead and order a CT. The other time, if it's contraindicated because of a patient's pacemaker, things like that, if a patient is um, sometimes insurance dictates that they have to have a CT first. So we might do that. Or if we're concerned for orbital trauma, graves, we can still use an MRI in that, but graves, this is, works very well, um, as well as proptosis and swelling of the eyelids can help with, um, with, uh, ruling out some different etiologies. So back to our patients. This is actually not our patient. This is my patient from residency. Um, that I got to take all sorts of great photos of. And so I keep them. This was my CT on the patient showing us that, yes, we did have uh, calcifications that did show up on CT. This was my photo as well as my B scan. So looking at the B scan, mm -hmm. we see that the arrow is actually pointing to an arrow of hyperreflectivity within that optic nerve head. So when you're using a B scan, you're looking for the optic nerve head. Remember, you're going to have the area of, um, you're going to have kind of a shadow right behind the optic nerve head so you can see it. And then right at that area, uh, right at the apex of the shadow where the optic nerve head is, you're going to find that hyper reflectivity, which is the calcified optic nystrusin. Within the photo, we can see, and I think it's good to think about what's the difference between what we're going to see with a patient who's true papilledema versus pseudoedema or an optic distrusion. And remember that with that optic distrusion, you're not going to have a uh, poorly defined optic disc border. In papilledema or edema, it's going to be a non-distinct or a, a um, an indistinct border. It's going to be kind of fluffy. With our disc drusen patients, they're still going to have a very defined disc border, right? And we're going to start to see these kind of lumpy, bumpy areas. Now, it's hard to see in this photo, which is why we dilate and take photos, right? So we always want to take a peek with our two eyes because guess what we get with that? Stereo. It makes it a little easier to see. But guess what? For the sake of our uh, lecture here, we've got a nice zoomed in photo. And so when you look at this, you can see much better that you can appreciate the lumpy, bumpy areas around that disc border, as well as you can see that uh, it, you can actually see the border itself. In the fundus autofluorescence in the picture to the side of it, we can appreciate the areas of the hyperfluorescence. And this is what it's going to look like on FAF. So that's pretty cool, right? Now, are they all going to look like this? No, because we're going to have uh, our younger patients. It's going to be more, it's going to be more buried. So it's going to be a little bit difficult to see. So let's talk about some alternatives and what's coming out as of right now. So this goes back to uh, that consortium that I was talking about that got together back in 2022 of neuro-ophthalmologists kind of saying, hey, what's our protocol now that we have better uh, diagnostic criteria? Uh, uh, better diagnostic tools, what's our diagnostic protocol? And so what they are saying at this point is, yes, still use autofluorescence. That's great if you have it, but we also need to be using OCTs. Um, OCT really is a great way to identify it. We just have to learn how to do it, right? And that's what you and I are going to talk about right now. So let's look at this. So we've got top picture correlating with bottom picture. And we're going from severity of, on that left side, we've got a very defined, this is probably my 60-year-old patient who has optic distress, and we see all those lumpy bumpies. We can appreciate, appreciate the elevation of the nerve itself, and we can even see probably, you know, some of those little individual drusen that are in there. And then below it, we can see within the OCT, these crypts or these areas of um, internal loss of signal, right? A signal poor core 
with hyper reflectivity around it. And I've got a, I've got a more detailed one we're going to look at. And then going into our middle patient, I bet this patient's probably in their maybe mid twenties, thirties or so. So it's had time to enlarge, but not to the same level as our other patients. And then finally we have what would probably be my 18 year old patient where, yeah, that looks like a kind of maybe elevated, um, temporal area in the patient or an elevated superior uh, rim in the patient, but I wouldn't necessarily know that it's a patient that has optic distrusion. I just looking at the nerve and thinking, okay, it looks a little different. Okay, so let's break it down to what does it actually look like and what are we looking for? So with optic distrusion, we have a dark area that you can see right there with the ODD. So that is our disc drusen, right? And it's a signal poor core, which means it's going to be dark. And when you look right above it at the border of it, you're actually going to see this hyper reflective margin. And the hyper reflective margin is different than when we look at our, our um, actual papilledema patients. And we'll look at that in a little bit. Uh, what we see is that we have this very scalloped border and it's that hyper reflective margin. And then look down below the disc drusen. And down here, you're going to see these hyper reflective horizontal lines. So we're actually able to see the laminar carbosa and the reflectivity below that area. Okay. So when we look at our true edema in these nerves, we won't have that. It will be completely signal poor all the way down. Now, looking here, this is same, so just a same thing, just another way to look at it, right? So this person's looks a little bit different. And again, we're seeing that um, core, that signal poor core, hyper reflective margin. We see a little one off to the side. So where the second asterisk is, that's a smaller drusen. And then the PHOMS is off to the side. Um, PHOMS is not the disc drusen. You see how it's actually... Uh, it's got a full signal in there. And we're going to talk about what that is later and where else you'll find it because we find it in some other things. But I don't want you to confuse that area with being a distrusion. Distrusion is not going to have a signal. It's going to be dark. Okay. So, so, so what is, your, we, is your pointer work on your on your, uh, your computer or mouse? Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Even better. So hyper-reflective margin here. And then we have the core here where it is signal poor. I don't know why this one says signal poor, uh, hyper reflective poor, because it is actually a signal poor. There is no signal there. PHOMS is off to the side. So this is actually, we'll talk about what exactly this is, um, but it's a hyper reflective ovoid mass. Um, and it is not actually the drusen. And then down here, we see the horizontal hyper reflective lines and the other thing to, that you'll see is you'll see some shadowing right here. That's from a vessel. That's from up here. Sometimes, especially in the beginning when I was trying to learn how to do this, I'd be like, okay, is that a blood vessel or is that actually a drusen? And I would kind of go back and forth between doing my autofluoresce, doing my OCT, doing my B scan and, and making sure that I was correlating. And that's how we kind of learn, right? We look at enough of things and we finally are able to say, okay, no, this is what that is. And, and this is what this is. So with visual field, remember we said up to 87% of these patients are going to actually have a visual field defect. That's a lot. Now, more often, again, this is going to be my patients later in life. Um, 40 and up is about when I start to see everybody's different, okay? The, how, how it's going to present, when in life it's going to present, and how it's going to progress is really dependent on the patient. Uh, but the most common visual field defects that we're going to have with these patients is going to be a sectoral arcuate scotoma. We may get an inferior nasal step. For sure, we're going to get an enlarged blind spot because of where these are located, and then we can also get a concentric peripheral constriction. Now, obviously looking at this patient, this is a significant visual field defect. This is a patient that I unfortunately now have to have a conversation of, hey, we can't drive, right? You can see central, well, depending on your state, right? My state, no, this was a, we're, we're probably not driving. Um, 
central vision in one eye was, was doing okay. It was just unfortunately in a situation where not ideal. Now, what do we do with this? Well, two things. One, what does this look like? This looks like glaucoma, right? We already talked about what's the mechanism. Damage to RNFL, loss of vision. What does that sound like? Glaucoma. This is a secondary glaucoma. This is damage to the optic nerve and loss of vision, secondary to damage to the RNFL from the dystrusin. Um, we want to watch these patients. We want to watch them just like we watch our glaucoma patients. Uh, we want to watch them, you know, monitoring with OCT to see how the nerve is doing, how much tissue do we have, watching the visual fields with these patients every six months. Uh, sooner if we need to, depending on how aggressive we want to be and how aggressive the, um, oh, how progressed it is with the visual field loss. Um, with treatment, unfortunately, there's not much to do because of the mechanism of what's going on. There is no known cause. We can't go and surgically remove these because obviously we will damage the optic nerve head. And that is a much more absolute loss of vision. Um, there's no known way to decrease the progression. We're working on it. Maybe we'll get there. We'll figure out a way to decrease the release of the, um, of the metabolites into the area, calcification, slowing that down. But for right now, the only thing that we are finding is to essentially treat it like glaucoma and anecdotally say, okay, I'm going to put you on my, my personal is I'm going to put you on alpha gain P. I would normally say, Hey, let's stay off of names of things, but I'm also an ocular surface disease specialist. So let's be honest. I'm not going to use generic alpha gain P. I'm not going to use bromonidine because it's really toxic to the front surface and causes allergies. I am in fact going to use alpha gain P. Why that? We use it twice a day because of the theoretical neuroprotective properties. We don't have a lot in these patients. Um, as I even have in this slide, there are a couple of studies that have looked at uh, higher IOP in association with visual field loss or thinner RNFFL at the time of presentations. And they're not necessarily finding that lowering IOP is beneficial to preventing um, in correlation or kind of extrapolated from, they're not finding that people had a higher IOP to begin with we're having a more progressed uh, loss of visual field or thinner RNFL. But this is the grandma and me test, right? If it was me, if it was my grandma, what would I do? I would I would put myself on alpha again. I'd put my grandma on alpha again because I don't have anything else to do at this point. Um, so that's kind of the what we would do with this is just monitor, try to lower the IOP, Although there's not really hard evidence to say it's doing much, it's better than not offering anything. Okay. We're going to, Greg, Actually, were there any hold questions? On. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Before you, before you go on, there are a couple of questions. Okay. Yes. One question comes out, can someone have disc drusen and glaucoma? And I'll, I'll let you go with that one first. Chicken or egg? Chicken or egg? Um, is the disc drusen causing it to be glaucoma? And how can we tell? Because typically the distrusin are pushing it. So when you look at the nerve, it's not even cupped. It doesn't look cupped because you've got something else kind of pushing everything in. So uh, sure, they absolutely could. If you have a patient, I'd say the, the time when I would think that that maybe is going on is a patient who has like ocular hypertension, somebody who does actually have like a high pressure, high 20s or something like that. Um, and also has optic distrusion, but there's absolutely nothing to say that they couldn't have both. Then the other question, and I, I know what my thought is here. If you have an OCT that shows what your image showed, why would you need a CT scan for this? So um, prior to the consortium coming out with something, you would need either a CT or a B scan because it was not gold standard. At this point, now that they've put that out there in 2022, you can argue that you are still upholding the standard of care and standard of diagnostics. So I think you at this point could, and especially if you feel comfortable to say, you know how to diagnose it that way. If you are like, you know, I'm still new at figuring this out. I'm not a hundred percent then you probably want to go ahead and back it up with a B scan and, and or a CT. 
you see, Richard, uh, if if uh, if you don't mind, mo most of what you, you know Cecilia is talking about is relatively new with more sophisticated OCTs. Most of the uh, the images that you see of a CT that was found accidentally because somebody was looking for true intracranial disease. Um, the OCT just is not a very good differentiator with disc drusen uh, in early disc edema. So sometimes these patients still need a workup, and even the even when you use OCT, because disc edema in the early stages it, it's very hard to differentiate on OCT. Yep. So even going back to our patient, look at this. Is this as as defined as it was with the one that I was showing on how to read these? No, it's not. It's kind of a jumbled mess. Now, can I tell that it's not edema because of other things we're going to talk about, which is the A signal? I don't see an A signal. Um, and I, if you look through and you scan through, you're going to see that there are some optically um, empty areas. So we are able to essentially de decide that this is what's going on, as well as when you look in the patient's eye, you can actually, this one, you could actually identify the drusen because they're so progressed. When they're not, the nuances on, uh, as Greg was saying, um, sorry, as Joe was saying, it, it is really difficult to 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 say, hang your hat on it, right? And at the end of the day, when you're dealing with, is this somebody who possibly has edema and the things that can cause that are much more concerning, you probably don't want to do that. So I would agree with them. You know, going back to an earlier question, when they ask, can you have disc drusen and glaucoma simultaneously? Yeah, the answer is yes. You can also have disc drusen and a brain tumor as well. You can. You can. Uh, I, got, I think we have part. one more question here. Uh, just looking for clarification. Did you say damage of the RNFL due to disc drusen is considered a secondary glaucoma? Like, would we call that glaucoma? You would call, I mean, you could call, I do. So when I say optic distress, and as soon as I start seeing that I'm having visual field defects, I will so, I will also add on secondary glaucoma because now I'm going to be monitoring them. I need to argue with insurance as well as I need to be coding correctly. So it is a secondary glaucoma. You've got visual field damage. You've got RNFL damage. So you're monitoring and it's progressive. My okay. two comments are going to be yeah. that to the audience and, and those listening is that uh, um, that these are different than retinal drusen. So we use the word drusen. So when you look at the morphology of these and the composition of them, that they are not anything close to um, uh, drusen that are found in the retina for specifically macular degeneration. And then the second comment that I'll make is that um, a lot of people think that these drusen move and that that's what causes the atrophy or that's what causes the 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 ganglion the 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 axon of the ganglion cell to die um and i like that i think it's cool to call it a secondary glaucoma um but they don't move it's actually the atrophy of the of the axons above making it look like it's moving because now they're dying so the 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 drusen don't really move uh, in there um, you're just able to see them a little bit easier. Yeah, no, they don't move. They just get bigger and they start pushing up. It's bigger not actually and, moving yeah. as in they're moving up. Yeah, they're just starting to compress that area. So, okay. I think we're caught up on questions and- uh, Those are good ones. I like that. Those were good. Yeah. Okay. So we'll move into patient two. So we look at this photo, right? We see one eye, because that's all I'm going to give you. And in this eye, we see that the patient has some atrophy, right? It's kind of a pale nerve. Um, you would, you know, it's, again, it's 2D, it's not 3D. It's a picture. We can't tell exactly whether or not is this a truly deep cup. It kind of looks like it might because of the bending of the um, of the vasculature. But actually, when you look at it in slit lamp, this is a very shallow pale nerve. Okay, so I'm going to give you those hints. We're going to move into the visual field. So we look at the right eye, right eye visual field, completely normal, no defects, reliable. Left eye, we've got dense constriction, 360 central involved, and overall desensitization of the of the vision. Okay. So 
Not great. Um, now, how did this patient get to me? Well, this got to me via the glaucoma specialist who said, this isn't glaucoma. I don't want to deal with it. Cutting, figure out what it is and uh, figure out what the underlying cause is so we can make sure that it's okay. So start asking the patient questions. No history of diabetes. Hypertension is controlled with oral medication per the patient. So I always check. BP was actually normal in office that day, but we know that that fluctuates, right? Does currently use sildenafil and has for the last several years. Patient has no history of major surgeries with complications or blood loss, significant blood pressure drop, um, does not report excessive alcohol use. So my question to you all, polling question number two, what is the next step for this patient? What would you like to do? MRI of the head and orbit with and without contrast, blood work, including CBC, A1C, ESR, and CRP, both MRI and blood work, or no thank you, refer this patient to someone else. So as this question rolls in, Cecilia, just quest question about, you know, you said use the grandma test, using the alpha-GAN to treat and so on and so forth. Are you going just to remove some stress factors, maybe lower the I IOP? Yeah. Um, or are you, because I think the thought out there is that if it was neuroprotective after 20 years, we'd have a little clearer idea um, that it's neuroprotective. We're not going down the road of neuroprotection. We're just kind of taking the stresses off, right? Correct. You're correct. Yep. And I did not clarify that. So thank you for bringing that up because that's that's actually a really important point. When I give somebody that drop the IOP lowering medication, I'm not using it just because of the neuroprotective because you're right. At this point, if it was true, we'd have some. Um, if anything, I'm using it to relieve the stress on the inside because I can't relieve the stress from the backside. Okay. Just yep. wanted to clarify that. Just make sure we're all on the same page. Yep. Yep. All right. And we got to end the poll. Perfect. So we've got 59%, both MRI and blood work. Beautiful, high five, that's what we want. Um, also, no thank you, refer out is also an acceptable answer. I will take both on that. Understandable. So I'm gonna go, go into what we're gonna do in a second, but I wanna go back here and make a point as to why did I ask this patient history of major surgeries. When we started this lecture, we started talking about needing to ask our patients questions about health, right? Systemic health surgeries, any kind of issues that they have or anything that they've had done. Now, when we talk about surgeries uh, that have complication with blood loss or even a significant BP drop, the patients a lot of times don't even know. Okay. And it's, it's, you might have to dig into surgical notes or you send it to me and I dig in the surgical notes. But the problem is if they have a significant blood loss or blood pressure drop during surgery, that means they're getting poor perfusion to the extremities, including the eye. So patients can wake up from surgery having experienced an NAION and not even realize it because of um, blood pressure drop during surgery. So that's where that comes from and why I asked that question. So what are we gonna do from this patient? We're gonna order an MRI, we're gonna get blood work. Let's just touch base on how to order an MRI. And these are my kind of definitions of what I do. Everybody's a little bit different. And I think it's really important that even if you don't order MRIs, have something in your kind of wheelhouse of what you're going to do if you ever have to, right? Hope you don't, but if you have to, know what to do. If it's emergent, you're going to probably want to send this patient to ER within 24 hours to 48 hours at the most. When do I say is emergent? Somebody who has a cranial nerve three palsy with um, pupil involvement that just sat on, somebody who has an optic neuritis. These are patients who they're um, at a high risk or somebody who is needing to have quick treatment because we know with like optic neuritis, we want to diagnose it as quick as possible so we can get them on treatment so that it's effective. Um, with that, know who your local ER is that you would want to send these patients to. If you have an ER that has ophthalmology or an eye care um, physician, um, some use optometry as well, that is associated and on call, that is the ideal place to send them, okay? Because then that means they've got somebody in-house who can come in and take over and make sure things are done and taken care of. Um, 
You can send the patients with a written script for an MRI of the head and orbits with and without contrast. That's usually what I do. Um, and then I also include, why am I ordering this? The patient has sudden in decrease in vision with pain. I'm concerned for this. Um, I also give my cell phone number so that they can reach out to me to answer any questions. And I send my patient with every single test that I did printed out so that they can give it to the attending or whomever's going to see them so that they can see what's going on without necessarily needing to repeat and or they may not have the option. A lot of hospitals don't have a way for them to have OCTs or visual fields and the eye care professional on, on, on the case is going to want that. Uh, the other thing is prepare your patient. No, I'm not sending you for an MRI to the ER. Um, they're sending you to the ER for an MRI and they're just going to do an ER, an MRI and send you home. You're going to get admitted. Just be prepared for that. In a non-emergent situation, so somebody probably has papilledema with a likely, I'm thinking, non-tumor mass or lesion uh, that's not visually significant. I'm meaning wanting to get an MRI within the next week or two. I'm going to send them to the um, outpatient clinic, so an MRI center or a CT diagnostic place. And if I, when I'm talking about what we're going to order, what's the difference between some of these tests? Okay. So an MRA versus an MRV, you will probably not order one of these. Um, we use them to look at the vascular and artery system, right? And that this is usually not the primary um, test that we're ordering. This is like a secondary after we've gotten ruled out the big, bad, and ugly or figured things out with having an MRI, we'll order this. But if you need to order one, so if you are concerned for an aneurysm, this might be one of those times, you want to order an MRV. Why? Well, because it's going to give you more information. When they push the dye through, how does that dye get to the veins? Through the arteries. So get an MRV, you're going to get the information from an MRA and an MRV. So it gives you a little bit more information. Now with an MRI of a head in the orbit, if I, do we need both? Should we order both? If you can get both, yes, get them. Okay. Why? Because they both give us different information. But if your insurance is, if the patient's insurance is saying, hey, cool, no, we're not going to, we're not going to authorize both of those. And you don't have time to do a peer-to-peer, -peer, or it's not an option to do a peer-to-peer, -peer, or you get denied on a peer-to-peer, -peer, um, do an MRI of the head. Okay. And why? Well, the orbits are in the head. Now, is it as dedicated? No. Will it give me as much information on the orbit? No, but it's a good place to start. Because remember the head is a whole head, right? So the slices are thicker to get that whole area versus an orbit, which is a much smaller area so that the slices are much more concentrated and closer together. So if it's a very small lesion, we may catch it on an orbit and miss it on a head. Now I'll tell you why we would go with head first. Two reasons. One, if it doesn't show up on head, you can argue that you need an orbit, especially if you're concerned that this patient has optic neuritis. Two, you're going to pick up other things within the head that may actually be the cause. And three, we need to, especially with something like an IIH or a papilledema, someone who has papilledema, we need to rule out or rule in um, a Chiari malformation. Okay. And that's back here. And so we want uh, an MRI of the head. Before anybody's ever going to do a lumbar puncture on a patient for further diagnostics, you have to have an MRI of the head to show that they don't have that. Because if you do a lumbar puncture on a patient who has a carry malformation, it's going to herniate. We don't want that. That's a bad thing. Um, pregnancy, we can order MRI with and without. Um, we, can, we can order an MRI on our pregnant patients, but we don't want to use contrast. So we would just do MRI without contrast in these patients. Uh, we do want to avoid patients who have metal implants, pins, pacemakers, implanted cardiac defibrillators. You can ask those questions, but guess what? The, the other people who are actually going to perform it are going to ask that too. Now, good thing, a uh, random thing that I've learned recently because I had knee surgery and I actually have some pins in my knee now. Um, there are some metals that are made, um, especially now um, that, uh, you know, 2023, 2022, uh, and, and I'm sure before then, but that are okay and MRI safe. Um, your 
implants for the eyes. So when we talk about um, patients who have the eye stent uh, inject, some of the other stents that are put in, those are actually safe with MRI as well, because that's a question that I get from patients. Now, if you have claustrophobic patients, you may want to know if there is an open MRI option in your area. Sometimes Valium helps. Uh, have a phone a friend PCP who will prescribe it. That's not something I typically prescribe. Um, some states, I'm sure, and some people, maybe they feel comfortable for me. I'm like, nope, that's, that's good. I'll let your doctor handle that. So this is my imaging requisition form. Um, it's gone through a couple iterations. It looks a little different now, but I like to have this so that it is something I can just check off the test that I need. Why am I ordering it? Add a bunch of information. And I don't have to sit there and think, oh man, what else did I need to put on here? What else should there be? This is just an easy way so I can just kind of make sure I'm, make, I'm checking all my boxes for my patients. Okay, back to our patient. So we got testing. Blood work, CRP and ESR, completely normal. Why are we doing that? Remember this patient age in the 70s, loss of vision, we're concerned for the, um, the risk of giant cell arteritis or anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Mm -hmm. So we want to rule that out, right? Nope, those are normal. So that's good. We got an MRI of the orbit and head with and without contrast. MRI of the head, completely normal. MRI of um, the orbits, abnormal. So we actually had an asymmetric hyperintense signal in the left optic nerve without enhancement with associated volume loss of optic nerve. Oh my goodness, what does that mean? It means the optic nerve was shrunk, there was atrophy. So posterior to the globe, we had optic nerve atrophy. Um, and that is indicative of an optic neuropathy. So what did this patient have? A non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy which is a localized ischemic event at the junction of the optic nerve. When we talk about ischemic events, again, the most common causes for this are, pe are um, concomitant systemic issues, talking about having diabetes or having high blood pressure and chronic microvascular damage. Um, these patients tend to be younger than our patients with AION, which we remember is 50 and above. These can be in the 40 to 60. Signs and symptoms, they may have sudden painless vision loss with a severe visual field defect and um, very significant visual acuity defect. Uh, and this, can, this tends to be persistent. In the patient, we will find that they'll have an APD in the eye that's, that is affected. And if we are seeing the patient at the time that it has occurred up to about six to eight weeks after, the nerve will still have some swelling. That's how I know that this patient probably had this occur three months or more prior to me seeing them, okay? Because that patient, when we remember looking back at the optic nerve, it was already pale and it was already starting to have um, the shallow cupping. So if it is that far out, I know we've already, all the swelling has resolved and we're now seeing the long-term damage. But if we see it close enough to the original occurrence, we'll have a pale disc swelling versus the hyper, uh, the kind of waxy disc swelling that we get with, um, or hyperemic waxy disc swelling, that, disc swelling that we get with an arteric ischemic optic neuropathy. Um, and we can also see some flame-shaped teens. This is a diagnostic, a diagnosis of exclusion. Most of the time they're gonna have a normal MRI. This patient actually had some optic nerve um, sheath or optic nerve atrophy. You don't see that very often in these patients. And if it's longstanding and it was very severe, maybe. Um, most of the time you're gonna have a normal MRI. Occasionally you're gonna have some chronic microvascular changes on, on an MRV. But to be honest, you're gonna see that in majority of your older patients, so 60 and above, who have some kind of chronic microvascular problem, you're gonna see those in there anyway. Normal ESR CRP, remember we're ruling out GCA. 40% are going to show some improvement in their vision within the next six months. Why is that? Well, the swelling's coming down. Swelling coming down takes stress off of those RNFL axons, so we get an improvement in vision. Don't promise them the, the world, though, okay? They're going to have long-term visual field defect. We obviously saw that in this patient. Unfortunately, it is just the reality of having an NAION. Um, but we want to monitor with visual fields. This is going to allow us to have discussions as we will with all of these patients, as we should with our glaucoma patients. 
maybe referring them over to low vision, talking about ways to kind of compensate for loss of vision um, to allow them to still do their daily, um, their activities of daily living and maintain quality of life. Optic nerve edema, like I said, should resolve within about eight weeks or so. And you can monitor this along with an OCT just to see uh, how, is it, how is it doing? What are we looking for long-term damage? There is a small risk of contralateral eye involvement, um, depending on what the underlying cause is. Uh, there's a higher risk, whether this is somebody who has chronic um, hyper, uncontrolled hypertension or diabetes versus somebody who had surgery and had a, blood, a significant blood pressure loss during surgery, and that was the cause of it. So there, the risk is higher in some than others. Now, what do we do for these patients? Well, as I already mentioned, we're going to continue to monitor them similar to our other patient, right? They have damage to the RNFL. We have visual field damage. Typically, these stabilize out at six months, but I have seen these patients progress. So I'm going to monitor them every six months with the same way I do my glaucoma patients. I'm going to look at their visual field. I'm going to repeat their OCT, and I'm going to see, is this progressing? Is it stabilizing out? Because as somebody already asked, what if this patient has glaucoma already? What if this patient um, is developing glaucoma? What if they were predisposed and they were going to develop glaucoma anyway? We don't know. We have to watch. And so if I'm seeing that the patient is continuing to progress past six months when it should stabilize out, then I'm going to start thinking about putting them on treatment. So that's typically, and when we talk about treatment, IOP lowering medications, because that's really all we got. So when we talk about NAION, so going back to our patient, one of the things that we were taught in school is erectile dysfunction drugs, or especially, you know, this one specifically, our patient, sildenafil. So I looked at studies for sildenafil, because my question is, okay, why is sildenafil causing these patients to have NAION? Is it a true cause and effect? Is it something in the medication that actually causes an NAION? Or is there something else going on? So looking at a study in 2006, they said they looked at 13,000 men who showed no increased risk of NAION in patients on sildenafil when compared with similar population, not on the medication. There was an incidence of approximately 2.8% patients per 100,000 men over the age of 50, which is actually very similar to a normal incidence of NAION in the population. So very similar. Okay. That's one study. It's 26, 2006. I was like, do we got, do we have one a little bit more recent? And what's the, again, what's the reason? Why are we still thinking about this? 2015, they looked at 1100 I, they looked at 1100 cases of NAION and they also showed no increased correlation with the use of sildenafil or another PDE5 inhibitor within 30 days of onset. So the idea here is that the cases that have NAION were more likely to also have concurrent hyperlipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, myocardial infarction, and cerebrovascular accident. So people who are more likely to have NAION on sildenafil probably have a microvascular problem. That is also typically the underlying issue when we talk about erectile dysfunction, patients who are more likely to have erectile dysfunction are also more likely to have these comorbidities. So in essence, what we're thinking is that, no, it's not the medication that's causing them to have, um, to have an NAION, they're just predisposed anyway. So what does that mean? Well, it means that I'm gonna discuss with my patients that, okay, look, they are saying that there, you know, there are some studies indicating that there may be an increased risk with sildenafil to have this happen. There's also a number of studies that do not show that. I'm going to have you go talk to your primary care doctor or the person who prescribed this to discuss what you want to do with the medication. Because I want somebody who I, I'm, I'm phoning a friend on that. That is not me. I did not prescribe it. My job is to take care of them, let them know about the issue, get them to the person who is, is truly treating the issue so that they can discuss what other options they have and what the risk factors are with it. 
Now with any ION treatment, little did I know um, until maybe about until probably eight years ago at this point that there are some treatments for NAION, okay? I remember coming out of school and being like, oh no, there's not really anything to do. And my, um, the, the doctor that taught me, my mentor for neurology, um, who was a neurologist, but also an oculoplastic specialist in my practice, he's like, no, no, no. We found a treatment for NAON. We use steroids. And I was like, really? What study is that from? Where I've, I've not heard about it. He's like, oh yeah, it's this one study, this one time with this one guy. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that's really helpful. So I went and looked it up and it was a study done in 1970. And it was looking at patients um, as far as long-term visual recovery with the use of 40 to 60 milligrams of oral prednisone for one month after the incidence of having an NAION. What they found was 85% of patients who were treated with 60 milligrams of oral prednisone actually showed an improvement in their visual acuity compared to those who were untreated. That study's a while ago. So I said, okay, what else we got? We have a 2008 study that looked at 696 eyes. Similarly, these patients were treated within two weeks of onset with 70 milligrams of oral prednisone tapered over one month. 69.8% of the eyes treated had an improvement in their visual acuity. Only 40% of the eyes untreated had an improvement in visual acuity. So we had a approximately 29% um, improvement over not treating in the amount of people who benefited and had an improvement in their visual acuity. So I think that again, grandma test, that means that I think that that, that is something that would be beneficial. Now, do I use 70 milligrams? Cause that's a lot. No, I typically go 40 to 60 and taper it over a month um, in my patients, depending on, on patient's weight and size. Um, and why is this helpful? So again, going back to stress off of the axons in the RNFL, right? The theory is by decreasing the swelling a little bit quicker than that six to eight weeks, we may be helping to decrease the long-term damage in the patient's vision. Now we still say, okay, great. Let's talk about who gets an NA. Who gets an NA win? Patients who have, we already talked about high blood pressure and diabetes. Is it good for that patient to then be on 40 to 60 milligrams of prednisone for a month? Nope because we may actually compound the problem, make it worse, right? We're, we're going to make their blood sugar go up. So there's a, a study actually that uh, was done in 2016 using levodopa for a possible treatment of visual loss in non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. And what it found was in 59 patients within 15 days of onset. So within that two weeks, remember, we're trying to get it soon. Um, within They were treated within two weeks of onset of NAION with either 25 mil untreated or with 25 milligrams of carbidopa, 100 milligrams of levodopa three times a day. And what they found was that 19 out of the 23 eyes in the levodopa group had a, an improvement in their best corrected vision and none got worse. Okay. So we've got 75% of these patients getting improved in their vision, no one getting worse. In the other group, in the control group, six out of the 14 improved and actually four out of the 14 got worse. So again, I'm going to say, I'm probably not going to leave these patients untreated. I'm going to give them something. Both of these studies make me feel confident as well as at this point, since 2016, I've been doing this. Um, I do find that this works well for my patients in, in, you know, helping to reduce the stress off of it. Hard part is what would they look like with it with, you know, what would their outcomes be without me putting on it, putting them on prednisone or levodopa? I don't know, right? But based on the studies, to me, it would say that they may not have had uh, as significant of an improvement in their vision. And I wanna give my patients any chance I can. I'm gonna open it up to any questions before we move on. All right, there are a few questions came in. One was a little bit earlier. Can you touch upon the disc appearance of posterior ischemic optic neuropathy? So with posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, um, 
you will eventually. So if it happens uh, um, acute, you, you may not see anything. That nerve may look completely fine, but the patient, similar to a posterior um, um, optic neuritis, if you have a posterior optic neuritis, you may not actually see anything, the optic nerve. You just get the same findings, a, a decrease in vision, um, patient sudden decrease, uh, painless decrease in vision, EPD, decrease in color vision, things like that. Either way, it's going to make you go, why can't you see? I don't see anything that tells me you should have this problem. So you're going to, you're going to send them for, for testing. But so the others, the other way that it presents tend to be similar. You just don't see the swelling of the nerve. Now, what does that look like long-term? Well, you're actually going to start to see some of that same atrophy. This patient may very well have had a posterior, um, is NAION, um, or sorry, posterior ION, um, because of the fact that he had significant atrophy to the optic nerve posterior to the globe. We don't know. We can't say that for certain because what happens after something like that occurs, you get both retrograde and anterior grade atrophy. So it extends along the area, um, of where the occurrence was to cause damage in both directions. Uh, yeah. So how, how long are they going to be on levodopa? One month. One month. And would you yep. do steroids and levodopa? Someone asked that the other day. Um, I have never done that uh, because typically if I'm doing levodopa, I'm using that in my patients who are diabetic. So I'm trying to avoid getting an, um, a blood sugar spike. Otherwise, I'm probably just using steroid. I've never tried to couple them, nor have I found a study that does that has done that. But that'd be very interesting. I'd be I'd be curious to see what that would what that would do. I think you're all caught up. Okay, perfect. Okay, patient number three, trucking along. You guys are great. Okay, so this patient, we see that on the right eye, we got green disease. We don't see any thinning of the um, of the RNFL as far as we can tell, right? Looks okay. Left eye, we've got thinning in the superior nasal and central quadrants. Actually, if you really look at it, you've got thinning 360. It's just more severe in those areas. Okay, so one thing to think about as we're thinking, okay, does this patient maybe have glaucoma? Where do we typically see primary open angle glaucoma occurring with damage first? Where do we start to see that loss of RNFL first? Typically follows the isn't. So this is a little outside of what we would normally expect. It's also asymmetric, some food for thought. So let's look at the visual field. Well, that right eye, that does not match what you would expect with that OCT, does it? Now we've got 260, 290 um, concentric or degrees of concentric uh, peripheral field loss with secocentral sparing. We've got some central sparing there, probably in a large blind spot. It is low reliability. Um, so maybe take it with a little grain of salt, but even if somebody has a low reliable test, that's pretty, that's a still, you know, very central area that's demarcated. So I, I think that I don't, I think there is some validity to it, right? Look at the left eye. We've got dense 360 constriction with central sparing. That one has good indices. So something's going on, right? Little spidey senses are, are tingling there. So my question to you, is this glaucoma? Yes, it's primary open glaucoma. Yes, it's secondary glaucoma. No, something else might be causing this visual loss, or I just don't have enough information. And you're all caught up on your questions. Perfect, thank you. Everyone's rolling in here nicely. Remember, try to reply if you don't know the answer. It helps make this a synchronous course. All right, here we go. Okay, so most of us are saying, no, something else might be causing this visual field defect or the visual loss. Some, many of us, right, we're saying we don't have enough information, which we don't, right? Of course, I'm not going to give you everything. Um, 
but it could also be secondary glaucoma. As we've been talking about, a lot of the things is that down downstream from neurological damage or from other instances or things that happen to the eye, we end up with what's considered kind of a secondary glaucoma. So that's not wrong either. Absolutely. Now, let's do this. Let's see how it started. So this is the patient about a year prior to those two tests that I showed you. Now we look at the visual field here. We see an enlarged blind spot. We see maybe some scattered defects. Um, overall, pretty reliable in the, well, actually a little low. Uh, we've got high false positives and high false negatives. Um, in both eyes, more so in that left eye than the right eye. But we definitely have, you know, overall, not, not too concerning, right? Maybe a little bit of an enlarged blind spot. Well, let's look at the optic nerve. Okay, looking here at the optic nerve. Well, if you want to go green, we're definitely green, but we're a little above the green, right? We actually have swelling. Both optic nerves are swollen here. If you look at the grayscale photo, you can appreciate that the borders or the... Um, the optic nerve head borders are actually slightly blurred. They're not distinct. Um, and then looking down as you continue through the photos, you can see that the uh, numbers within our wheel are actually elevated compared to what we normally would have. Not a lot, right? But it's there. Okay. So this patient, my current concern is, okay, you probably have IIH given your age, gender, everything else. Um, let's get a little testing. Let's figure out what's going on. And I'm not too concerned right this moment. I think we can do this in about a week or two, get you in for an MRI, um, just because the visual fields look okay, right? So we went ahead, gets his, gets his MRI and I see him. So we're three weeks after I originally saw him and the results come in. They say normal MRI of the orbits and MRI of the head shows no acute or other brain findings. Great. No tumors, no masses, no lesions, no curing malformation. I'm happy with that. We do have a partially empty cella, which is clinically significant um, in the setting of and may be related to benign intracranial hypertension. So that means that there's an increase in cerebral spinal fluid causing the cella to look empty. It's kind of expanding it. Okay. Cool. Well, now we know, yep, that that kind of concurs with what I was thinking of. Probably IIH, we ruled out the big, bad, the ugly. But here's the kicker. And this is why I always repeat my testing when they come back for their MRI results and why I have my patients come in for MRI results so I can get the testing. This. Yeah. That's a big change in three weeks, right? This is definitely a huge progression as far as constriction in the visual field. While the indices still show that this isn't a great test, we obviously looking at the gaze tracker, patients doing better. This is showing a much more significant um, visual field loss. Not great. Well, guess what? This is what's causing it. Look at those optic nerves. Look at how swollen they are. Look at the gray photos. You can see, you, if you couldn't appreciate the um, papilledema before, I know you can now, right? And then looking down through the, um, the tracker, look for it towards the, um, the, the middle of the middle of our chart here. You can see that the levels are just, they're off the chart. And if you could actually see the number, if you can see them, we're into the 300s. Not good, okay? We are vision threatened. We are quickly progressing and we need to treat it now. Is this the common thing? Absolutely not. With IIH, this is not usually how it goes. Most of the time you see them back and you see that maybe it's progressed a little bit. Usually it's about the same, especially in three weeks, but that's why I do it because you need to know. There are sometimes with some of these patients, and I find it tends to be my male patients, that they will quickly have an elevation in their um, in their papilledema and in the swelling and have a much more significant um, loss of vision. So this patient was then sent for an emergent optic nerve head fenestration. And as we can see, while we did get the swelling down, unfortunately, the long-term damage to this patient's vision is already there. Now, what about this patient? 
That's actually before before you go on. That, that's a really yeah. great example that people really need to know about. This condition, while it's not common, is known as fulminant fulminant IIH. You know, from onset of symptoms to vision loss is only a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So I always like to, I always like to say IIH is a slowly progressive disease until it's not. You got it. And then you never know. You never know. I say male, but you know, it, it's not to say that I haven't had females that do that as well. So we have to be careful. And it also depends on underlying cause, which we're going to talk about. So what about Cecilia, this do you want to talk real quick yeah. about what an optic nerve head fenestration is? I bet you there's a few people out there that aren't really yeah, absolutely. familiar with the surgery, what they're doing. If you just want to kind of give like a quick elevator speech on it. Yep. So we're actually going to get into that when I go into all of the, uh, I'm going to go through all of the treatments for this and we'll go through that, but quick Perfect. synopsis of what it is. Um, they actually fenestration. So they actually go in and make small holes within the optic nerve um, sheath behind the eye. So they're creating these small holes to allow the fluid to come out. Now it sounds great. Maybe this is one, it's super invasive. Problem is that it is not only super invasive, it has about a 50 to 75% fail rate. So it doesn't work well. We don't use it as primary as I'm going to talk about um, in treatment for these patients, but it is an option. And especially in those patients who have this kind of severe, quick onset of swelling, we know oral diamox and other treatments are not going to get that down the way that doing an optic nerve fenestration will. So this patient, this is another IIH patient, so not to surprise you, but so that we can kind of see, and we're gonna get into that so I can talk more about the disease process. Um, but we see here, looking at this patient, she's got fairly significant thinning of her optic nerve head. If you look at the photos um, towards the bottom of the, 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 um, the slices of the optic nerve head itself, look at the thinning, look at the nerve itself. Me talking about how these patients typically with um, neurological issues, have more of a shallow cupping. Look at that. That's a very shallow cupping, but we see that there's a very thin amount of RNFL. She's already lost a significant amount of axons. Looking at her photos, we can appreciate while we can't see necessarily because it's not 3D, we can absolutely appreciate that she does have pallor. In this patient, she actually came to me as a she wanted a, a, a second opinion. She was seeing a neuro-ophthalmologist and they weren't doing anything. She wasn't being treated at all for anything. And she wasn't sure what was going on. And she's kind of frustrated. She was like, okay, here's what's happened. I'm a 49-year-old Caucasian female. She has optic nerve atrophy, um, progressive thinning that has started in 2018. And it was identified in 2018 when she was going for a LASIK consult. She was then sent to neurology who did multiple tests. They did MRI, they did lumbar punctures. They did all sorts of other testing, checking for autoimmune, unknown cause. And I'm looking at the notes that have come with her. So she continues to see this neuro, um, this neuro ophthalmologist or this neurologist over the next four years who thankfully, yes, uh, continues to take optic nerve head um, OCTs. However, what I see is that it's showing progressive thinning. Yeah, not ideal. Okay. So she no longer has swelling. She just has chronic progressive thinning. Guess what? She's got secondary glaucoma and they're not treating at all. So additional information on her, she still has ringing in the ears and whooshing in the ears. She still has headaches constantly. She's still having weight fluctuation. She actually has PCOAS. She was diagnosed um, a number of years ago. She's 49, so she was diagnosed about 15 years prior, but she had an ablation in 2019. She is perimenopausal, and she actually did have a lumbar puncture performed um, two years prior as part of the original workup, showing that the exiting pressure is 17. So when we talk about... Um, lumbar punctures and opening pressures, opening pressure should be about 18 and under. It's usually between 14 and 18. It's considered high if it's 25 or above. And we're going to talk about that in a moment because that criteria has changed and there's some other thoughts on it. And that's important when we talk about her. So I say, cool, we're going to go get another MRI. I know you already had one, but let's, let's get this done. Let's double check. Let's see what it, um, what we find, right? 
And so we find that, guess what? Unchanged still has, set, still has prominent CSF around her optic nerves. Unchanged, right greater than left optic nerve atrophy, greatest at prechiasmic, chiasmic areas. So we've got an increase in cerebral spinal fluid around the nerve. So we've got spinal fluid pushing on the nerve. The other thing, she has the pituitary gland is mildly flattened and the cell is partially filled with CSF. What does this tell me? She has IIH and it looks the same as it did before. And I, to be honest, I have no clue. I do actually know why they didn't treat. Um, it's because her, her lumbar puncture came back normal. So I say, cool. Okay. I know you're not swollen. You're having all the other symptoms of you're chronically losing your vision, your, your visual fields, your, um, OCTs are getting worse. We need to, we need to probably go ahead and treat you as if this is IIH and I'm going to put you on medication, but let's get a lumbar puncture first, because I want to round this out. Um, so we get lumbar puncture. Like I said, norming pressure is 20, about 14 to 20. They consider 18 to 20 to be like the higher end of normal. Hers is 20. Okay. Well, technically she does not meet the criteria of um, CSF opening pressure being 25 or above for IIH. Well, guess what? Apparently there's been a revision because I'm like, well, this doesn't make sense. And I don't agree with that. And maybe you're just, this is higher than what your normal is. So I start digging and it looks like they've actually in, I believe, um, 2000, they came out with what's called the modified dandy criteria. And that means that in a case of a patient with suspected IIH or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, if there are no other causes of increased intracranial pressure present with the CSF being between 20 and 25, because remember they used to put the criteria at 25, but if you're in that kind of in betweeny stage, um, if they have pressure under 25, above 20 or 20, including 20, and they also have pulsatile tinnitus, which she had cranial nerve four pal uh, nerve six palsy. Thankfully she didn't have, um, she has papilledema. Not right now. She doesn't, she is Drusen negative MRV with lateral sinus collapse, partially empty cella found on, op on MRI. So she's got two of these. Guess what? She's got IIH. So we went ahead and started her on treatment. So when we talk about IIH, remember that papilledema is a symptom of IIH and it can be found in other settings. And papilledema is a bilateral swollen optic nerve that's secondary to an increased intracranial pressure caused from one reason or another. And when we look at these patients, these nerves can be significantly swollen. They can be very mildly swollen. Just like in our first case where I showed you that we really didn't have a lot of swelling in that patient, but he did have, it got worse later, but he did have some swelling. Um, we may or may not have visual field defects in these patients. The most common visual field defect is gonna be an enlarged blind spot or a, sequel, a perisequel scotoma. Most of the time, they're not going to have any visual field defect. Um, if they do, if they have a very significant visual field defect and swollen optic nerves, that really, I mean, you're sending that to the ER. You don't want to wait on that. Obviously, if that my patient had originally shown up looking like he, he ended up looking like, then we should have sent him to the ER. Um, the other thing to think about is when we see a patient, when you're doing an OCT of the optic nerve and you're looking at somebody who has papilledema, get a macula OCT as well. If that papilledema extends into the macula, that is probably infectious. That is probably some kind of infectious disease. Um, and they're going to need to get a bunch of different testing MRI to start, but typically that's an, that's an ER patient. Okay. Now with IIH, bunch of different names, try not to use pseudotumor cerebri anymore. That's not actually the name we use anymore. It is benign intracranial hypertension or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It is a diagnosis of exclusion. So we have to rule out everything else for that papilledema patient and say, okay, that wasn't a curie malformation. That is not because of medications you're taking. And, and all of those other things, to get to it being idiopathic intracranial hypertension. 
these patients, most common signs and symptoms, they're going to have obviously the papilledema, the headaches, tinnitus, tingling in fingers and toes. Sometimes they can have a cranial nerve palsy because the swelling can actually compress in the um, cavernous sinus on our cranial nerves three, four, and six. So you can get a partial or full palsy in these patients. Um, SVP, spontaneous venous pulsation. If a patient has a spontaneous venous pulsation, we know that everybody does, but if they do, and you're looking at it, you're like, is this edema or is this maybe something else? If they have a positive spontaneous venous pulsation, you can see it's not, a, it's not papilledema. It is not papilledema. It's something else. Because if that um, intracranial hypertension, um, the uh, cerebral spinal fluid was elevated, it would, it would stop the venous pulsation. So that one I learned from neuro-ophthalmology. That was, that was actually really helpful. Um, other things... Again, we already talked about, we want to do the visual field to see if there's a defect. So it kind of gives us an idea of where to go and how quickly to get testing. But we also want to call, check color vision, red cap, and check our uh, check for APD. Patients, usually if there's no uh, visual field, significant visual field defect, we're going to be ordering that MRI within one to two weeks. And then shortly thereafter, they're going to get a lumbar puncture. Um, you're probably not ordering that. That's going to go through somebody else, but I do sometimes order them. Um, and we're looking to check the exiting pressure. Again, is it elevated? We're also checking to see, is the fluid healthy and normal, or are there any other signs of problems going on? Causes? Yep, we learned fat, fetal, fer fat fertile female, right? Well, yes and no, okay? Look, other people can get it, okay? Is weight a consideration? Yes. For some people, there is a genetic predisposition that when they have this kind of tipping point, when their weight goes over a certain amount for them, yeah, they will actually start to have the problem. It kind of kicks it off. And um, some of that, you know, we know that the 10% loss of weight can help to, to kind of bring it back under control. But the other thing to think about that is actually there's a lot of hormone that we're finding out um, plays a part in this, uh, especially for females with PCOS. They have a very high correlation for having IIH. Um, birth control, for some patients, again, it's, it's adjusting the hormones. Um, the kind of good part about that is those that are hormone related, typically peri, uh, peri or postmenopausal, they end up on the other side to where it stops um, kind of occurring. Other things such as minocycline, doxycycline, that can also cause this to happen. But truly that's, I don't see that as more IIH because idiopathic, that's not idiopathic. We actually know what the cause is. I think that's more truly of a papilledema, but that does get lumped in there. Now, what do we do for these patients and what are our long-term concerns? We're gonna put them on the most common treatments are gonna be acetazolamide or Diamox or Topamax. If your patient has uh, a sulfa allergy, which I've had before, that's not gonna work for them. And when we put them on it, typically acetazolamide is the first, the first line because it gets a better response. It helps to decrease the cerebral spinal fluid production and uh, side effects that are common with that. They may get tingling in the fingers and toes. They may get a metallic taste in the mouth when they drink anything that is carbonated, um, as well as the one that makes me concerned and makes me think about taking some patients off is some, not many, but some patients will start to get brain fog with it and make it very difficult for them to function. So that's when I start to talk about decreasing their medication or switching. Um, tube shunts, or sorry, not tube shunts. Shunts are another option. So we talked about the optic nerve head fenestration. Shunts and fenestration are kind of in the same realm. Shunts are done though more often if the people are, falling, are failing on oral treatments and they're progressing. Sometimes they're done if somebody has um, an immediate need to get a very quick decrease in pressure off of the brain and the eyes. Um, but again, it's a very invasive. What they do is they put a shunt into the back of the brain that then drains all the way down to the abdomen to create an area where the cerebral spinal fluid can exit. Um, these also have a very high fail rate of 50 to 75%. Um, but it is another option that is done in these patients. With the optic nerve fenestration, as we talked about, that's actually making small holes in the optic nerve right behind the eye, but it is more of an emergent, not a long-term treatment. 
And again, it's only taking the stress off the optic nerve. It does not deal with the brain itself. So it doesn't typically help with other symptoms such as headaches and things. The other thing that I think is worth mentioning is we've started to do more research and find out that another issue found on MRV. So remember looking at the vasculature within the brain, we find that people who have IIH, a lot of them have a issue with a, um, a compression of their tr um, dural transverse sinus. So one of the veins in the back of the brain in, on one side versus the other. And so going in and doing a stint similar to an aneurysm, putting a stint in to open it back up actually helps to reverse this as well. So that's kind of a neat thing too. But that's why a lot of these patients, you'll actually see that we order MRVs is because we're starting to look more for that. So looking at the cross-section, OCT is really important with these patients too, again, because as we were talking about previously with optic nerve head drusen, we can get a different appreciation of the appearance. When you look here in these patients who have IIH or an increase in cerebral spinal fluid, look at this lamina cribosa right here towards the bottom. We see it's going up. This is called the A sign. This tells me that there's something pushing. That's the cerebral spinal fluid pushing up. The other thing is look here underneath the, um, the areas of swelling. We see that we don't get that area of um, optical missing, right? It's not empty. It's not optically empty there. We get the shadowing because it's actually swollen tissue. The other thing to look at here is that we don't see that hyper-reflective border that we do in our patients who have optic nerve head drusen. So going back here, we see the optic nerve head drusen border right here. We have some of the hyper-reflectivity under versus this patient who actually does not have that. Um, and we see more, we don't have that optically empty area. This one doesn't really have the A sign. They don't always, but if you see it, you do know that that's what's going on. Now, this parapapillary hyperreflective ovoid mass-like structure, mouthful, right? So this is what we're looking at here. And it is a hyperreflective area that um, they are starting to, we're seeing that's coexisting on OCT imaging. Um, a lot of times we're seeing in patients who have optic distrusion as well as IIH. And what they think it is, we don't know a lot about it, but as diagnostic, or as our um, ability to image these things are getting better, we're getting a better idea. And so they think that it is uh, herniating axons. And um, so we're getting a buildup of distended axons into this area and a bulging. Um, and so you might see this in patients who have uh, who have the IIH, some patients who have tilted disc syndrome. And so we think that this may actually be why some of them look like they could have heaped areas. Myopic discs also show this, um, as well as patients who have MS related optic neuritis. So here's just another picture of that. Now, what do we do for our patients with IIH? We need to make sure that we're working along with the neurologists, neurosurgeons, to manage these patients. So we wanna follow them every three to six months for repeat testing to aid in telling the doctors, are they responding to treatment? Um, are they getting better? And then long-term, we want to make sure that we are uh, monitoring with OCTs because these nerves have had stress. The RNFL has had stress. And so there is a risk for there to be long-term damage and possibly chronic damage. So monitoring them again, like a glaucoma patient and possibly treating them very similar to a normal tension glaucoma patient, like I needed to do in the patient that came to see me. I went ahead and got her started on IOP lowering medication to decrease the risk of her progressing because we had four years of data showing that she had. Any questions? You want me to keep moving along? Sorry, I was having a tough time getting it launched. Oh, that's okay. We're not there yet. We can oh, be. Sorry. Actually, why don't we do that? We're going to go to patient number five. So patient number five here, polling question. We see that we've got kind of a demarcated, um, respect, kind of respecting that midline almost completely to it there, right? We've got a... Um, by temporal, I'm sorry, we've got a 
right-sided homonymous hemianopsia. There we go. I had to think about it um, in a patient. So if we're looking at that based on visual field only, what do you think might be happening for this patient? Do we think that they had a stroke? Do we think they have a pituitary tumor? Do we think they have a retinal problem? Because don't forget, as um, Joe said, retinal problems can cause issues too, but that one's pretty demarcated. Um, or is this patient a bad test taker? Because that can be an issue too. Can you go back to the visual field so they can see it now? Absolutely. I think that's a phenomenal idea. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Stop sharing. I got to relaunch it. There we go. Relaunch. There we go. There we go. Joe, any questions roll in here? Oh, you're muted. There was a question about the V pattern. I think you kind of uh, kind of covered that. Yep. The OCPQ I wanted to point out I I versus no. dystrophin. Yeah. Um, so when you have um, increase in cerebral spinal fluid, it's going to push up from above. So your lamina carbosa is going to be more into an A form when you're looking at it um, on your OCT. And that's a good indicator. It doesn't always, it's not always there, but if you do see it, that is a very strong indicator that that, that patient has increased in cerebral spinal fluid. And, and, and this good, could actually go to a question about the recumbent V pattern that is indicative of parapapillary edema. I didn't, I didn't really see a good example of that, but no, sometimes I didn't see a good example. But what were you know, gonna sometimes see? when you see this this V pattern like this adjacent to the optic nerve. That's yes. the spread spread of edema. I I don't yes. I don't bet on that one. I don't. I don't I either. I'm not going to. I'm not going to uh, put much stock in that. No. And if we look here, even in this patient, yes, we see some of the V, but I don't find that's not. And to be honest, that's not one of the things I tend to look for, and that's because of this. I don't. It's not something that I find as consistently. But it's not wrong. It is one mm -hmm. of those extra things that we can just throw in there. Okay. But what someone can do if they go back and look at your ones, you had a nice, I wanted to point it out and forgot, but way back at the beginning when you did your optic nerve head drusen, if you look at that kind of that RPE mm -hmm. deflection, they all kind of deflected down. And when you have optic nerve head edema that you watch it, that RPE will come in. And I look at it all the time whenever I'm looking at raster OCTs, looking at the nerve, that RPE kind of just kind of takes it down. In edema, that RPE kind of goes up, and that last one you showed, it was kind of the the last edema patient. There, you could see it. it that it's RPE going, goes yeah. up because the pressure is coming from behind. So, okay. Patient so the question I have too is for the audience out there: Is Cecilia used Diamox? If the patient had a uh, an, an allergy to a sulfa antibiotic, would you give the patient Diamox? I want the audience to think about that question. And if your answer is you would not, I would say give a test dose and see if they're okay, because most likely they're going to be okay. Yeah. And if you want further explanation, you'll have to pay attention till the Sunday lecture that I give with Tracy Offerdahl. When a patient has allergic uh, a reaction to an antibiotic, it doesn't mean they're going to be allergic because they're not allergic to the sulfa. They're allergic to the uh, aerial amine group, which Diamox does not have. That's the That's the antigen. So you could give the Diamox, but I would do a test dose first. I love it. This is what I'm going to be doing Sunday. I'm going to come listen to you. All right. <laughs> okay. So, well, guess what? This is what's going on. Not a stroke, but it is in fact a glioblastoma. Ooh. Yeah. So this patient had a glioblastoma. He actually underwent surgical procedure for, um, to remove it. So they debulked it. Um, and, uh, so that was actually what was causing that visual field defect. 
In the interest of time, we're going to move right on along into the last little bit here, just so we can keep it going. So the last patient, um, that's not the one. We're going to go to this lovely gentleman right here. So we've got a 73-year-old male, visual field, comes in to me. I've never seen him before, but he's been to my clinic plenty of times, okay? And he feels like he's coming in urgent vision in that left eye. I feel like it's worse. So I do a visual field, I do an OCT, and I'm like, well, okay, this is what we got. So we've got, um, you know, overall desensitization in that left eye. We've got a pretty good superior um, loss of vision, central affecting. Uh, so therefore, I'm like, well, how reliable is this? So then in the right eye, we've got maybe an early RQ with some secocentral defect. Well, what's his issue, right? The patient does not have MS. He's had a bilateral optic neuropathy. He's gone through so many tests. He does not have MS. He does not have neuromyelitis optic spectrum disorder. No immune disorders or inflammation. MRI findings, um, SIMD myelination. They're not really sure where to go with it. But we look at the OCT and we can see that, you know, we've got definitely thinning, um, but not to the, to the level of what we would expect for this patient to have issues with his vision. Now, my question to you is assuming that the patient's vision was decreased, so his BCVA was decreased, some questionable worsening on his visual field, and the OCT was completely stable, um, what else should be done? Look at the corneal surface, look at the macula or retina, double check the refraction, all the above. All right, questions are rolling in here. I'm going to launch the handout one more time for them, and then I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And I'm going to launch the handout one more time. It'll be coming in the post event email too. 85%, all of the above. Absolutely. High five. Got to look at the front to the back, figure out what's going on. Well, um, so what was wrong with this patient? Why was his vision decreased if everything else looked stable, right? Don't forget your macula. Don't forget to look at the other things because there are times when patients come in, especially when they've got um, glaucoma, when they've got secondary glaucoma, when they've got neurological issues, there are other things that can happen that can compound it and can cause us to actually have loss of vision. And so we don't want to forget to look there too when we get so excited about looking for the unicorns. So I'm going to say key take home points. Big thing, if it smells fishy, check it out. Um, order testing in-house and out of house when appropriate. Make sure to continue to monitor these patients and be a part of their journey because you are you are there and there are things that you need to do to watch to make sure that we're not um, seeing progression and things that you can help with, whether it be from treating a secondary glaucoma, referring out for low vision devices, or just holding their hand because you know them. And then make sure if it's within your wheelhouse and you feel comfortable, treat when necessary. And don't forget to phone a friend or refer if you feel like it's something that you need a little help with. And I do apologize we didn't get to all the cases. We got really great questions. We got kind of carried away with talking. Um, but if you do look through the handouts and you have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to further discussion. I love talking about eyes and um, the brain. So. And I think we do now all understand that the eye is brain. So it is. All right, I'm going to have you unshare your slides. I'm going to share mine. Share with any further questions in the chat box. I think there is a there is a question or two. Um, going back, it's it's hard to identify which patient, but uh, the one who had a normal lumbar puncture. Mm -hmm. Do you treat them with Diamox and alpha -Gan P or just alpha -Gan P? I treated her with Diamox and alpha -Gan P because she was still symptomatic for her IIH. Mm -hmm. She still had headaches and ringing in the ears. She was uncomfortable. So I needed to deal with the cerebral spinal fluid from that aspect. 
um, as well as putting her on alpha gan P to try to decrease the pressure within the eye to slow down the progression of damage to the optic nerve. I also am suspect that the increase in cerebral spinal fluid was still pushing and causing some issues with her, um, uh, causing some more damage from posterior to the optic nerve. I can't say 100% one or the other. So we did both. Okay. Is that all the questions, Joe? That's it. All right. Well, Cecilia, in 2023, you know, we had you at a live meeting, did a few uh, webinars. I think this wraps it up for 2023, but I am sure we'll have you back in 2024. Um, and so we appreciate it. The questions have been answered. I want to thank you for doing uh, Is It Glaucoma or a Masquerader? I know I picked up a few uh, uh, pearls here along the way, which will make me a better clinician uh, in the clinic tomorrow. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.